Right, attempt number three. Apologies to everyone. It seems to be there seems to be some really big issues, whether it's on Wi-Fi, whether it's um, whether it's the actual particularly well. So let me try and add the boys back in. We'll have one last crack. If not, we might have to abandon uh, worst case scenario, but we shall see. Uh, right, we've got Dan and, and Mike back on. This is good. <laughs> uh, and it's now just now I'm a herpes. You can't get rid of me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, I've tried to add Sam back in as well. So fingers crossed that Sam comes back in. Well, we've got a black screen. Are you there, Sam? Yeah, it should be. Just loading in. Mm. Oh, that's good. Turn on video. Can you see it? No. Oh, it doesn't like that, does it? Hold on, hold on. Oh, he's gone. He's gone again. Oh, he's, this is fun, isn't it? Well done, Instagram, doing a bright, blinding job tonight. 20, it might, 24. It might be linked to where it all went down um, the other day, wasn't it? I mean, they had loads of issues the other day. So uh, let me try and add, add Sam back in again. Right, there's, there's a black screen, but there's no Sam now. Can you hear Sam? I, I can I can hear you and I can see Dan, but Oh well that's all you need. Yeah, it keeps flashing a black screen and can only be What just... are you doing it it's Sam, what are you doing it from your phone or your iPad or He's gone completely now by the sounds of it. Sam? Can you hear me? We yeah. can hear we can hear can you. Hear um, I don't know. Did, does it on on Instagram online? Does it have the option to uh, to do it? Or? Are you on the computer? I'm not at the moment. No, I'm, I've, I've I've always I've always done these on my phone and never had a never had an issue. Yeah, that's what I've done now. I've, I've gone to <laughs> someone kidnapped sandwich in a sack. <laughs> Quite possibly, he's been at the moment he's been driven out to Epping Forest by by a Jew. We'd love her or something like that, potentially. Um, I've had worse Wednesdays. Yeah, uh, do you know what? You talk about worse Wednesdays. Uh, this morning I walked into my shop and all the comms are down. It, oh, it, Mark, nobody it, wants to hear I know. you. Yeah. It was, honestly, but it was crap. It was complete crap. <laughs> that was after being delayed and the train coming in as well. So you couldn't make it up. It's just one of them days, the perfect, dare I say, shitstorm. Okay, um, guys, I'm just logging in on the laptop and i'm going to see if that will let me do anything um, oh that sounds weird you haven't got your thumb over the picture have you, you haven't got your thumb. No, no 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 not at all um let me come out very strange I, I, right, we just wait for sam so we'll, we'll get there in the end this is the joyous uh, the technical problems here which is it's just genius absolutely genius but unfortunately this is uh, we have to do it. Um, thing is, if, so if we did it, if we did it on like a Zoom, mm. you couldn't have the interaction with the people that that's, are. That's exactly the point. That's exactly do you know what I mean. Yeah, we we quite like that. I mean, you can do it live, but uh, um, again, you know, actually, it's only probably two thousand people in there, which which isn't. You shouldn't be um, uh, knocking it. <laughs> 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 that would be brilliant, especially they got, the, especially taking it back to the nineties, and they got deep Northern Ireland, Northern Irish accents as well. Uh, that might be slightly sinister. Yeah. Um, let, let, let's let's all just hope that Sam is really okay and that he's he's not pretending to. Uh, if he starts blinking in Morse code or something, then um, we could I'm be sure in some fine. I'm sure he's fine. Michael, did you want to start with your introduction? Yeah, I'll start with it. Let's start with the introduction. So for those who don't know, um, my name's Mark Stringer. I, many years ago, started collecting die-casts, mainly Second World War aircraft, um, son of an RAF technician who worked on Canberra's and Victor's. So I've got aviation in my blood, unfortunately. Um, so many years ago, we started this page on Facebook and it's migrated to YouTube and Instagram, uh, where we, and obviously many people have joined um, over the years, including Dan being one of the founding fathers. Um, and James, who's no longer on the call, um, 
and we just share our collections with the world, I guess. Um, and then we started this monthly chat um, about bringing on different themes. Uh, and we have brought on a World War One specialist today who I shall hand over to now to introduce himself. So, Mike, the floor is yours. Yeah, it's going well this time, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so my name's Michael. I'm a World War One obsessive. I've been since since I was a little tiny boy. Um, fell into diecast by accident and I'm now hooked along with everything else I collect. So, um, yeah, I live and breathe anything early aviation. Brilliant. Over to you, Dan. I'm sure people know you are, but... People are sick of me now. <laughs> uh, name's Dan. Like Mark said, been part of the page from the literally the very beginning. Um, collections changed from World War Two to mainly jets now. Um, yeah, so my input on the conversation this evening regarding World War One is going to be very minimal, but I'm just there for the ride. Absolutely. So just to talk through the plan for the night. So obviously we've done our intros. So we're going to have a bit of a World War One session with Mike, who is you know the godfather of World War One on the page, as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're then going to go through some of our top five. So our top five wants, and they could be current models which have been manufactured or potential models we'd like to see in our collections um, over the coming years. A little bit of a chat around Masters of the Air uh, as well, which is, I know, not necessarily diecast related, um, but certainly something which I'd like to see in diecast, which I, I'm a little bit surprised hasn't tied in. Um, I'm wondering whether that might be something to do with HBO or or the, the obviously the other manu uh, you know, the manufacturers haven't paid the rights on it. And of course, any questions between you guys on that, um, you know, if you want to share, whoever's watching, if you want to share any of your top fives, I'll happily take some notes and give you a bit of a mention as well. We'll talk through them. And then, and then we just sort of summarise at the end. And we've got model of the month as well. So I'd like to hear any of you guys, what you feel has been the model of the month over the last four weeks might be something that's joined the collection it might be something that's just been newly released like the corgi bow fighter that does it rather sexy um regardless of it being right or wrong which is a bit awkward uh, and then we just we just end the call for now so hopefully we just about an hour's worth we try and keep it to, to an hour we don't want to bore you to tears too much so let's get going with world war one we've lost one of our specialists who seems to have been kidnapped and been at the moment being taken don't. in a sack to a forest and i thought you were going to go worse with that then for a minute i won't <laughs> lie <laughs> I, I, I toned it down quite well yeah, I, thought. I, I thought you were yeah don't matter anyway <laughs> mike so uh, I, I know obviously we, we chatted uh, slightly before uh, offline or online in the three or four attempts we tried to run this um so tell me about world war one what what is it that's got into world war one stuff to be honest i don't know by rights like the rest of you i should be a world war two nut or modern jets because i was born in 66 my grandmother worked for pratt and whitney and then uh rolls royce as an engineer which was unusual in the day my grandfather was a polish pilot flew all sorts of things so you'd think i'd be spitfires lancasters all day long but from a very, very, very early age, and I have no idea what it was, whether it was, um, I think possibly about the time I was born, um, those magnificent men in their flying machines came out as a film. And in those days, you had to wait like 15 years for it to come on the telly. Um, and I, I've got a very distinct memory of watching that, being fascinated by these things made out of bits of string and planes, and then were falling out of the sky. And it's, it's, it's gone from there, really. I've always, and, and and as I've got older, I've become even more obsessive. So I started with books, as you as you do, when you're that age, you read Biggles, and the first Biggles books were obviously when he was when he was in the Royal Flying Corps. You read all the, and in those days, the 1970s and 80s, was when all of the pilots and survivors had, had, were getting to an age where they were writing their memoirs. So um, John Harris had a lot of novels and, and all of the, the major pilots were all writing their, their autobiographies or there were biographies. And it just stemmed from there. So I, I became a book collector. Books are fantastic and I love books and I can't talk about books enough, but we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> but, but when they're on the shelf, they're a bit bland and boring. They don't, there's nothing visual about them. I then got slightly into photographs because um, as a bit of World War I history, Unlike, and I don't, 
I don't know, so perhaps somebody can correct me if this was the same case in World War II, but specifically for the Flying Corps, um, it was a court martial offence to take a camera when you flew over to France. So when you were on a French or Belgian airfield, cameras were hidden, secret. So there's not many photographs. So when photographs come up, they tend to be quite rare. Um, at the same time as well, the British press were very, very wanting to put forward the armed forces as a unit as a mechanized unit as a as a body of people so they frowned upon glorifying people's um individual achievements unless unless there was a vc involved um so the royal flying corps pilots didn't tend to get the same glamour as the french pilots or the german pilots um so again there's a, there's a, a lack of material available so when it comes up it's, it's quite rare from there, I sort of went into um, postcards. Postcards are a social document in their, in their own right. The very early ones, you either buy the postcards and they obviously got the images on the front, but then when you actually look at them, the, there's the, the date marks and the stories on the back, which might not be related to the front, but they're all social history. And then in 1990s, I got this, which was a free supplement in Flypatch magazine that talked about collecting anything to do with aviation and everything that was in there I was already collecting but upon the front page it said tin plate just as an aside this is what they assume us book collectors look like so that's your typical book collector that's what I dress like when I'm not in front of the camera <laughs> by coincidence I took I picked up that magazine for, for, for I think a 10p or something at a charity shop the following night I was on YouTube and I was a bit sick of looking at cat videos playing the piano and just the old dodgy thing that you try and get away with after your missus has gone to bed um, and I fell into a, a DWC video about diecast planes and for all of my knowledge on aviation in World War One I, I hadn't got a clue I had no idea that diecast planes were a thing as a boy, I had a bit of a dabble with airfix, but like in biplanes, if you're anybody that's tried to make an airfix model biplane, oh my God, the wings, the bracing, the, the white, everything, it's just an absolute nightmare. And I was absolutely pants at it, but I did quite enjoy painting them. So I discovered Code 3s. So one video turned into another video, then it turned into being interesting enough to go on the group. Then I found out that you can buy models secondhand on eBay. And it was just one of those things, it's it snowballed from there. The dark so spot. my collection now, I think, is about 116, 148 scale, predominantly. I've got a couple of interlopers that are a bit less than that. Um, and the other thing is the range of manufacturers, Hallmark, were the before they went quasi-religious and made loads of cars in the States, had two years where they brought out some 148 scale die cast models not just world war one but predominantly world war one model power were about in the 90s but they've gone uh matchbox made four world war one 19 uh one to 48 models um and then stopped doing it carousel uh, have stopped making them they've got fantastic models but are the world's most expensive die cast you've ever seen corgi is the only the only manufacturer that's still knocking them out um and I don't want to take over and talk about Corgi, but predominantly most of you are, are Corgi mad or you've got a lot of Corgis in your collection. What I would say is it's a bit of a periphery for the Corgi stable, really. One to 48 is a bit of an odd. I know they're, they're starting to do some sort of like one to 48s now in the jets and, and the modern stuff. Um, it's a bit niche and it does have a few faults. They seem to think that, you know, Von Richthof and Anudet were the only two pilots that flew planes against everybody else. So they'd knock out 50,000 models of them and missing out other people. But when they get it right, they get it bang on right. And the revelation for me was the Bristol fighter. When the Bristol fighter came out, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe. When, when somebody said they were rumored to be making a Bristol fighter, I was like, there's no way they're ever gonna make one. It's too complicated. The bracing's too difficult. As a plane, the wheels actually attach through the bottom of the wing. So how are they going to work that out? It's a big piece of metal. It's 
very very slim fuselage big massive engine up the front i'm sure they're not even gonna be able to get the weight in right but they absolutely smashed it out of the park absolutely smashed it out of the park and to my mind it's one of the best world war one one to 48 models around bar none I'm glad you mentioned that because obviously my my li um, limited knowledge of World War One. Um, yeah, you know, I, I love World War One aircraft, but it's not because of the scale thing. I, I, I'm a little off put with it because like 999 percent of my collection is 172. And I really don't like mixing the scales. I think it looks weird. But the 148 range from Colgan, and I know they're getting a bit of fire at the moment for the hit accuracy on the bow fire and. You know this and that which you know to be fair some of it is quite justified which i get uh, because people are very very passionate about this hobby but then 148 world war one range with the exception of the camel which does need a bit of work because the bracing looks like it's got walls made of brick rather than wood it's fantastic it's brilliant and actually if you look at the value as well the value is the same price as a 172 fighter and I think in terms of bang for buck, I think, I know we talk about price rises, but the one World War One stuff really does. One, it keeps its value. And two, I think it's actually relatively decent value at 60 quid or what? I I would definitely agree with you. Well, even, even better than that, and a big up here, I'm going to mention Andy Becker um, at, at Lofty's, uh, has done me a brand new spad delivered for like 48 quid. Well, and, that's just like phenomenal. Absolutely and, phenomenal. You know, and for those who haven't watched, he was on the previous video as well. So do check out his his profile below, Lofty's Hobbies. And they're based up your way as well, which is more dangerous, Mike, that he lives relatively close to you, that you could pop in and see him. And that I have popped in a few times and seen him, yeah, yeah. That naughty man, Andy, has actually sold me, will be four models. By, so a, a Defiant, a Spitfire, a Dakota. And now a bow fighter as well, which will then be followed by a Ju88 and a swordfish. So thanks, Andy. Really appreciate it. He's back on the train. <laughs> <laughs> He's back on it. I'm back, baby. He's but back. No, no. Yeah, just to reiterate, um, an absolute diamond of a geezer, to quote a local phrase, I guess. Um, obviously, Sam has now rejoined the call. Uh, he's managed to escape his captors, which is handy. <laughs> uh, you mean it, Sam? Don't worry, I'll, I'll touch upon it. Uh, I'll touch base upon you uh, that bit uh, at the end of the video. Uh, so, Sam, World War One. So, what what bits have you got in your collection, and what got you into it? Um, more or less, more or less a bit of everything. Um, I would say probably bar a spad or a camel. Um, I mean, the only the only British ones I've got would be the um, the Bristol and the the SE5 because I mean those the, the other uh, the other two Allied um, fighters I should say they're not I I, I don't know I, I just I've seen I've seen enough of them to know that they, you know they're not I mean you've touched on it already but they're not they could really do with a, a re, bit of a, a rehash um, what I have got um, certainly you know the likes of the D7 Albatross um, they're all they're all fantastic and as you say like really good value and i think the first the first one i bought was a um a dr1 um and it was the fritz kemp uh, release which is now quite quite a difficult one to actually get hold of a lot of the early um dr1s are um you yeah, know particularly if, if you think about the uh, von richthof and um and the camel set the day they were only a very very limited run and they they completely sold out um so they did they did a special edition of that um the plane ripped off and went down in i think it was back in like 2018 for the 100th anniversary of his death or whatever so yeah it's um it's quite varied i mean the the, the paint the paint schemes that they managed to pull off on them are just absolutely fantastic um particularly the last two last albatross and the d7 i really i really thought they they knock both of those out of the park um and it's quite shrewd to do those two um together with the uh, distinctive sort of dazzle pattern um going on both of them so um yeah i've been i mean i think going to going to hendon and being in the being in the world war one hall probably sparked my interest on that uh you know big deal um and of course there's not another train says when they introduced the wood grain prop make a big difference here will finish yeah and on that as well, they've refined that over the years. So when it 
when they started doing that, it was sort of very, it was wood grain, but it was blocky. But now it, that they've got the technique and the printing down to make it look like actual wood. So if you look at the releases now compared to um, back then, they've 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 come on leaps and bounds, haven't they? I, have. I, I think the one bit that really stands out for me around World War One is the way they do the the pastel lozenge finish on there. So yeah. they get a lot of hate. Oh, we get a lot of hate around the Motlin on the Luftwaffe stuff the 172 range and, and and i guess you know it seems to have got progressively worse over the years which is weird in terms of um uh, an overall finish with the advances in die cast making and, and paint finishing that mm. also inch finish is just it's, it's i don't know if, i don't know if you're going to die well this year lads um i know i know dan's not intending to but i certainly i'm going on the saturday but where um potential for some real nice world war one the um, guy called Mikel Carson, who's based in Sweden, who's bringing over his, his CR7, I think. I think it's his triplane as well. I'm not entirely sure. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm bringing two of his aircraft, which he's going to, um, he'll truck over and then nice. really. Uh, so, yeah, uh, just, well. just grab the, um, grab the Albatross. That's running. And that, you know, that's, that's, potential, that's on the scene nice. this year. So, one. one of the guys I know who runs, um, the, well, we help. Um, coordinate the displays at Shuttleworth, James. Hope, mm. I hope James, but um, he's getting married in a couple of weeks mm. actually. So um, hopefully um, uh, I'll see him now. Um, but he's uh, uh, obviously arranged the, the the albatross. is going to be based there, and he's going to be doing some shows there in the summer, which is great yeah. to see because I think Jason pointed out in the previous one, on one of our failed attempts to get going, that Stomari's uh, near Malden is well worth a visit if you're Definitely. interested. Definitely. Yeah, I was I was down there I was down there in the summer and they I think they they ran they they fired the albatross up but they decided that the the engine was wasn't wasn't running quite right so they didn't fly it. Uh, while we pause, one one of the things that I'd like to do is is to completely agree with you, Mark, and I'm going to just grab uh, the stock Fokker. It's going to be very difficult for you to see that. But the model camouflage, the lozenge camouflage on the top wing and then on the bottom wing is bang on 100% accurate to the exact colour pantone and the, the slight colours banding is exactly how Fokkers came out of the factory. Absolutely perfect. Beautiful bit of kit. It really is a beautiful bit of kit. Um, and, you know, I, 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 fair play. And this is, the, I guess this is the frustration where you get something right that's over a hundred years old <laughs> and then we'll do uh, a typhoon and forget to paint the can uh, the inside of the cockpit and, and i guess that's where the frustration lies yeah. it's just they've got to be uh, you know i, I get corgi get a lot of pelters uh, the thing is with corgi sort of diverging a little, little bit is that they release six a quarter or whatever it is or six a third or whatever the way they work they're sorry the, the three um catalogs a year if they get one wrong it's a high percentage of their production where if hm do 15 releases a month and get one wrong out of the 15 it's a very very small percentage and before people have had enough time to talk about it they're on to the next batch of releases and that's out at the door and it's forgotten about so it's it's a bit more forgiving for the hobby master i think because they do so much uh, yeah. Well, Colgi is, is a big chunk of their release schedule. If one is wrong, then it gets a lot of pelters, as we've seen with the Canberra. Uh, and as we're not so much on the bow fighter, although it might be historically slightly inaccurate, it's a bloody beautiful looking scheme. It's certainly one I'm going to be looking to add to the collection. Um, having a bow fighter in that sort of um, that green and grey finish, I think it's lovely. But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going off on, on a tangent. No, no, so, it's a valid point. And one of the things that that they got all kinds of wrong was when they brought out the Albert Ball SE5. I mean, that was just like so wrong, 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 wrong on every level. If anybody's ever noticed it, is a little white bit on the tailplane with a new New Zealand fern on there. Yeah, that was because it was flown. That actual plane was flown by Grid Caldwell. Uh, Keith, I have that. Bet, bet, I have that too. But bear with me. Yeah, yeah. he was the first. He, he was a first World War pilot who flew with 60 Squadron with Bishop and ball for a time um and he painted the the fern on his tail plane but if you if you hold yeah. that up sam so that yeah. that that exact plane at the time of that color scheme was yellow not red and was flown by coldwell 
and was never flown by Albert Ball at the time he was in 60 Squadron. By bizarre coincidence, when he was in 56 Squadron, he did fly that plane, but by then it was fully uh, PC-10 Olive Drab. And they got that. I can't believe they got it so, so, so wrong. Absolutely so, so wrong. Yeah. I mean, there are uh, there are some colour profiles um, with with his name and and that that exact scheme. So they've they've probably just gone off that. It it all comes from a nineteen nineteen, I think, painting that right did at the time of of his supposedly last flight, and and they got like a ninety well a sixty squadron colour scheme on it, and this that that colour scheme was, and again goes back to World War One Bishop which they brought out. And again, the Bishop SC5 is older and obviously a lot more basic um, brown prop. You know, there's a few issues with it, but it's still a, a, a decent plane. That was bang on perfect. And the, the Albert Ball was just absolutely shocking. So, yeah, they're not infallible, but when they get it right, they properly get it right. Uh, I've talked about model power and, and, and hallmark. Um, model power specifically have got some fantastic they only tend to make dr ones there's about six of them in the in the selection including jacobs including kemp's kemp's is actually i think nicer than corgi's fokker but the issue is with them because they were building the 90s and accuracy wasn't it they've got same color props so jacobs black dr one's got a black prop kemp's green fokker's got a green prop the um, rick toffin's red fox has got a red prop so it's little things like that but when you're a proper nerdy collector like me it doesn't the accuracy has to be there to a certain extent but you want to collect them all anyway you know we, and we're going to go into obviously that's the danger everybody's top five one of the ones in my top five is matchbox's 148 frank frank luke it's not even got any bracing wires you know it's like the wings are thick the brace the struts are thick the wheels are all wrong but i've never ever seen one and it's in the top five yeah i mean you've got obviously the and the guests also trying to code three a world war one aircraft with bracing already fit and the stuff must be significantly harder i would imagine than yeah, flat. I, I personally will not want to attempt no because you did yeah the best way obviously is you obviously you're a bit of a code free man now dan now but you've got your airbrush giving it all uh, and of course gary as well he's very so, I, back in a minute but you can dismantle the jets, can't you, in piece bit by bit with a World War Two, yeah. They uh, literally just um, pop apart. Whereas World War One, you take that you blue. take all that wire yeah. out and it's 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 never going back in the same place that it came out of. No, absolutely. The only thing that, look, just a little bit of input in regards to like all the colours and, and obviously World War One, like I've said, I ain't really got a massive clue on. Although I've I've really listened to that and found it interesting. Was what I find with Corgi is you'll see, and this, this isn't me defending Hobby Master because they've cocked up on a numerous releases now in regards to some of their jets. What you find with Hobby Master that Corgi don't do is Corgi all of a sudden just released the finished aircraft and photos like the pre pro, if anything, of the Canberra, for example, the air tattoo, the colours were bang on. And I think. That I, don't get me wrong. Did they admit that there was an issue at the factory? No. Did the factory cock up on that? It's been mentioned. So I know. So they, the press. one thing I find with Hobby Master is they released the photos of the pre-pro on their website, and then they do actually take note of what a lot of collectors. And I'm not being funny. <laughs> In my opinion, the likes of Michael and Sam, they the enthusiasts and that's nothing against the producers that they the producers are there to make the money they're there to run the yep. business they're not necessarily going to have the information or the it's going to sound bad but almost the get up and go to do the research they need they're against the time scale blah 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 so putting that information out there on say for example mh3 um you've got numerous more than me i mean i'm just a beginner when it comes to jets but i mean you've got numerous collectors on there for jets you got michael for world war one i'd be putting the product towards them and going this is our pre-pro we're not going to commit to any painting until this is 
signed off and as a collector enthusiast in Michael's position, World War One nutter, does this look correct to you? Until that's a yes, I wouldn't release any. The Canberra and, and the latest Bofi have been a prime example. I think the issue, and this is not, again, not to defend Colgate, because I think there might be a day soon where manufacturing could well come closer to home. Mm. Um, because I think the, cost of to. the cost of shipping is now becoming prohibitive, uh, especially with, obviously, all the Houthi rebels bombing the crap out of anything that tries to pass them at the moment. I think it needs somebody on the ground. And I, I think we mentioned this before. We spoke about price rises and stuff like that. Mm. And it needs somebody in the factory on them. Whether it means a Chinese representative, someone who's a Chinese historian, just somebody. So you've got to remember, the, you know, the factory is here in China, Paul Gear back, uh, down in Margate, Ramsgate, wherever it is. Mm. It, the, sending pictures is not good enough. Seeing the actual product, an actual, not a pre-pro, an actual production copy before it goes in. Because yeah. all that, with Colgate, and they've done the right thing. So David has joined Model Hangar 3. Michael Clegg's been on there for years and years and years. They've done the right thing to try and engage with the collectors. And I guess we played a little bit of part in that, doing stuff with them, which is great. Yeah. And it's, it, it, I feel actually feel for David because he's gone on there with the right intention to say that we want to make this right. We want to fix it. We, you know, we, want, to, we want to have the best possible products. And actually, they've been let down by somebody either putting the wrong yeah. mix or and they've got they basically it all leaks out onto the internet before it even began. yeah i don't i don't know i don't know what the mandarin is um for paint the bloody cockpit or or put the put the second drop tank in but but they meant <laughs> that information it clearly isn't getting across very well no and i can tell you now, i can tell you now they are frustrated as we are yeah right, they're not going to be the product is going to make money whatever because the typhoon is a wonderful bit of casting. It's a brilliantly designed model. It's a fantastic addition to model aircraft collecting. And then something as stupid as that come out, they must have been kicking up. If that was me being the extroverted character and I'm I'm part of Colgate, I'd be kicking over my table. I'd be throwing things through the window. I'd be smashing the place up with frustration. Yeah. Because they're, they're passionate. These guys are passionate about it. They're not just, they're not just money men put into into the role, they are they are there because they give a shit about the product they produce. So uh, that's the defence side of it. But then it's inexcusable when you're paying top dollar, 150, that's... 80 pound for a typhoon to have that mistake. So you get both sides of the argument. And uh, uh, you know, we've, uh, I know we've, we've, stra we've strayed off a little bit from World War One here, but mm. there's, there's great. Oh, was... and just imagine if they fight, then that's exactly, I guess, what we need. Uh, we need we need to keep putting the pressure on because if we don't talk about it, then it'll happen again and it'll happen again and it'll happen again and it'll happen again. And we've seen it, you know, like I said, Hobby Master have made mistakes. Um, you've got to remember even someone like Noel, who is in his factory, QC in every single product, not every one of his products coming through is perfect. No, so one of his checkmate is, um, I think it was the um, Checkmates F14, it was supposed to be black, the nose section, and it come out like a royal blue and it's like well, that's not right but he so that, still said it through anyway but in the factory day in day out that these mistakes will happen and that's where i guess there's got to be a middleman and during covid you can sort of get why that was happening because everything would have been done like we're doing now yeah. through video call um and actually on a video or in different lighting as we proved with the camera colors look sometimes completely different so it's it, it's going to be an ongoing challenge, but that'll be an, that's, that's a conversation for another another day. It'd be interesting. It'd be one of the questions, I guess, when I eventually do get David and Michael on the call, which I keep pestering them about. I will drop. A, I'm going to drop an email tomorrow on the train to him, at marketing at Colgi, whatever it is. Um, he's got a direct them and just say, look, get your act together, mate. I want you on the call? Because um, there's there, there's look, look, we've we've just been waxing lyrical about how great the World War One mm. range is. And if you can produce something as intricate as a lozenge pattern on, um, you know, a Fokker World War One aircraft, then why can't we get a bloody cockpit painted? Which is yeah, and that's and that 
gets to the frustration. Now, like I said, but you know, I know they're passionate about it. It's not that we're we're just. I mean, they've they've taken a lot of unnecessary flack. I think on Model Hangar Three. I mean, to be fair, they're a bunch of miserable old gits on there at the best of times, and they bless them. But also very knowledgeable old gits, may I add. And I do apologise if Christian's watching, but he is an old git. Oh, yeah. uh, but you know, someone like Mark, uh, who's obviously on the DWC page, Mark Harbour, who wrote a really detailed on the reason profile isn't right. The guy has done his research, he's put the effort in. We should be using that inside the industry should be using that. Exactly. And, and that's what I, I, I let's, how much of an effect would it have on Corgi, for example, and Hobbymaster, but for the how much of an effect would it have on their business and their reputation if they were to turn around and go, Collectors, we're looking at releasing this. Does this look right? Yeah, job done. And then you've, and got, think... you've got a per, you, you, until the, the, you've only got the collectors to blame them. And I, don't get me wrong, I know Corgi do use certain people out in the collecting uh, world, so to speak, um, to do a lot of research for them. We know a few of them, Mark. Um, can, can they venture out into different places? Do you know what I mean? I don't know. It's it's a, it's an interesting discussion. I'm, I know several people would be more than happy to have input on the production and not ask for anything back. Um, well, in fairness, I would, it, and, exactly. you know, and I'm not putting myself forward, but mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm probably one of, I'm one of them, the biggest living experts on World War One aviation and early aviation. That being said, that's because most people that were into it are dead. So, <laughs> Quite default. <laughs> through, through old age, but I've got a I've got a massive. I mean, I've got a huge library, probably one of the biggest libraries in the world. Photographs, images, books going back to nineteen. You know, I mean, I've got here Billy Bishop's autobiography, first edition, nineteen eighteen. There's there's information in there. They because they they couldn't take photographs. They described planes in in detail, color schemes in detail. I'm more than happy to open it up you know if somebody from corby wants to come come and spend the afternoon taking photographs and scans it. exactly it's michael it's in my interest because i'm the one buying that model and i'm going to be the one saying no that's not right that's the wrong color scheme but then wheels if, are different. if it comes out wrong and it's been the collector's input into it we've only got ourselves exactly. to blame i suppose the worry for the manufacturers would be then still no, no one's buying the model I don't know. It's a, it's a, what I'd do, Michael, is, is contact Claire at Corgi or David at Corgi and turn around and go, I'm more than happy to provide support, not ask for anything back, but have email conversations with them and say, if you ever need help from regards to the World War One models or any, sorry, I'm, I'm presumed just World War, but any of the models, I'm more than happy to have input towards it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, I mean, if you like, I said, we, we spoke about the model hanger for before, the knowledge that apply, the, the stuff I I've learned mm. just by being right up some models is unbelievable. And people, again, you talk about time, investment of time. Some of the, the, the things written in there must take an hour or so to write, find the pictures and touch, just to mm. add some context onto that, that model and, and why either it's right or it isn't right or some of the detailed history around it. It's phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. And I'm sure Hobby Master use that, I'm sure caliber use it i'm sure colt use it as well and you know i i just hope that there is more of an open door policy in terms of right actually we've done our research but let's just double check it and cross check it and cross check it because there was an incident so with um i've used mark as an example and, and this says a lot about mark harbour as a as a person so he fed back around um ml417 uh, being wrong in terms of the the cannon placement and the outer and inner uh, and and the dedo stripes and stuff like that and he actually said oh, I, oh it was wrong I, I thought it was this but he'd done it he'd done so much research but what he'd seen was post d-day and not the actual time of d-day where they then swapped the this i think it was a c-wing to the e-wing or whatever it may be the placement of the the bomb racks underneath and that, ha, that how that affected the stability of the aircraft and stuff like that. Yeah, he put up his hand and went, Do you know what? Look, this is the information I've got, and actually was slightly wrong. So, like, fair play. But that's great because that shows you even the expert experts. We, we, we're going back to a time you're talking World War One. 
and the lack of pictorial evidence. 100 years from now, if somebody wants to make a blackjack typhoon, there is thousands of digital pictures in the realm, digital colorized pictures. You go back 120 years or whatever, or it would be 200 years to World War I, there's naff all other than books that Michael's got and descriptions. So it's, it makes sense why they're, it could be slightly wrong. Even World War II, everything's black and white. And when you colorize something, you're assuming colours. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like it's on the. I think on the on the uh, Berthold um, B7. Uh, Michael probably know. I, I believe it was that was meant to be lozenge underneath. Yeah. Um, but it, but it but it turned out it turned out white. Um, and also I think it was meant to be an earlier one as well. So it didn't have the didn't have the louvers going down the side um, of the engine cow. Yeah, Is that that's right? Correct. correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what they did get right is the little bit just in front of the the, the German cross, which was on his actual plane painted in olive green. First time I looked at that, I went, "Somebody's done the research on that." Mm. Going back, going back, back to what you were saying, Mark, on a slightly different tack as well, as a collector and an obsessive, but also because I've started dabbling now in in the odd bit of World War Two diecast modern jets, I, I would love. It's great that we have a collector card. And I understand the ethos behind that. But instead of a collector card, what I quite like is a little booklet or even like a little printed thing. History of the aeroplane, history of the, of the pilot. You know, what happened to that plane? Why was it special? If it was flown by a specific pilot, a little biography of the pilot, you know, things like that. Because it, 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 it adds interest, but it also furthers people's knowledge on the subject. You know, I, I, think, I, I think all the manufacturers miss a trick there it doesn't cost much to print a little bit of you know a little bit of card or a little bit of paper or even a little booklet just why is this plane special that it's day to be honest with you mate so i'm just opening this spitfire now so this spitfire obviously got a little card that doesn't tell me no near enough no. about johnny johnson's demand what i think the discussion was had was they were going to be doing QR something like code. a qr code with a write-up yeah. and this is where you can use those people on model hangar three you could have a small biography of the man you know or, or, or written which you then scan and then read about so it adds that personal thing i mean johnny johnson you could read 150 200 pages of this i could sit on a train of a morning and, and read a short story about johnny johnson even if it's just that area around d-day and some of the missions he flew around D-Day. I could sit on the train and read that quite, quite happily. Um, and you know, for me, collect, it was, um, some of, some members are really obsessed with collector's cards. I don't really see the point of it. Oh, it's numbered 0001. Well, I couldn't give a monkeys because it's the same model that is 972. There's no difference to it. Yeah. It's not the first, yeah. model. they randomly put the cards in the box. It makes no difference to the price on it. I'd rather, I think, in terms of the QR code and some background history on it, I think oh, you're right. That Absolutely. actually, a bit almost like a mini diecast diaries, right? So in diecast diaries, they do, Michael does a brilliant job in diecast diaries. I love reading every two weeks yeah. on Friday. Not the two weeks after, it's all about cars. I'm not interested in the cars, Michael. I'm sorry, mate. But the, 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 the aviation one, I love sitting there on the train on the way in on Friday morning, music on, can of, can of Coke Zero on the go. And I'll read my diecast diaries and you see the paint, the paint scheme and the colours of the paint scheme. And you get some detailed history. That's what I'd like mm. to see around every aircraft and whether they can do that with a QR code or whether they can do that. I, I don't know. But I, I think I guess they already do it through diecast diaries to a degree. But well, James, um, James could stick it on the inside of the box. And I think old old Corgi used to actually do that. Um, but. Yeah, not really. Not they used to have a. It was a bit of cardboard, but it sort of tucked into the the yes. box lid. If you ever got some older older corgi stuff. Yeah. yeah. And for me as as well, and I and I'm passionate passionate about early aviation. There's no, nobody's interested. I'm not as a generalisation. Nobody's interested in it these days. You know, I've got three teenagers. They're they're not interested. Younger people, they want to know about hunters and Vulcans and and typhoons and you know occasionally Lancasters and Spitfires. It, it would get people involved. So I'm going to go back to obviously Stark's fantastic Fokker, absolutely brilliant for me. The synergy with that is Rudolf Stark was the the uh, leader of Jasper 35, the last year of the war. So his last 
last year of the war, he put in a diary, which is in a book called Winds of War. This is the best World War I aviation book ever printed. Printed in 1933. Mine's a 1973 copy. You can't get a 1933 copy for, for love or money. If you if you read one World War One aviation book, read this because it's true to life, frustrations, shortages, men, material, things going wrong, even the horrific things at the end where he's having to fight off communists who are trying to steal his aeroplanes and get his men safe back into Germany. It's just fantastic. Almost a, a, an anti-war war book. It's, it's a, a great read. And the, and, I, and again, I'm, I'm rabbiting on a bit. And I'm going to bring in something else now as well. You, but you heard Mike, haven't you? Let me know. Put the sort of shame. Arthur Arthur Brooks um, was uh, an American pilot. Hallmark did a copy of his. A lot of people will have seen this. So it's a Spad 13. Um, this is the exact plane Smith 4 that's in the National Aerospace Museum in America. So you can go and visit this actual plane. Dayton. Uh, yeah, yeah. As, a, as a small point, the roundels are wrong, but that's Hallmark. And also, for you collectors out there, this is number 0528, no, 05258 of 24,500. So Hallmark knocked out 25,500 of these. Get out. Get out. So, <laughs> but the tie-in for that... That's 24, 24 yeah. releases we're calling yeah. them. Mal, Mal, Walter Luciano wrote this book in the 1960s all about him. In the back of it, it's all about post-war. Little picture of his SE5. There's no known photos of it. So I bought myself a little cheap bishop. Knocked up a really, really nice Code 3. I made it sort of like a bit knackered because in the book it actually says that our, it was an old um, RFC SE5. They flew them until the early 1920s where they were just basically just dropping to bits before they were replaced with Thomas More Scouts. But that whole thing for me, books, code freeing, models, information, it's all that synergy. For me, it's a visual point for what's going on in the books and then it can refer back to the books, but then refer, then refer back to the models. I stick them all in the camera and get them out and have a look at them. And that's, that's what keeps me going all the time. You know, we, we have to wait quite a long time for Corgi to release World War One models. And I have to say, in their defence, I think the amount of models that they put out is about right. You know, I'd love to say, oh, I'd love a new one every time, but they can't just justify it. You know, and I, and I think the amount that they, they do put out, and especially recently, have been absolutely fantastic. So I can't knock them for that. You know, they do think of it as it's a bit of a peripheral market for them. They're obviously making enough money selling them because the, it, it has to be viable but you know and and the difference you know there'll be the dr the dr1 last one we do another one soon the, the new spad looks fantastic and again it's an interesting subject the last eindecker i know it's udex but it was still a good good eindecker with the, the the sort of like brushwork on the on the uh on the front nose absolutely brilliant yeah yeah i can't i can't knock them enough and again corgi could quite happily sit on the laurels keep knocking them out without any thought because they're the only people making world war one 148 die cast yeah. so they yeah. could pull out any old crap to be honest and we we'd still buy it because we're the end they're the only people knocking it out but they're very conscientious and as i say occasionally they get it wrong but more than more than often they get it right and yeah i'm a big fan do you know what we've been talking world war one nearly an hour and <laughs> and to be honest with you i've really enjoyed it because i've learned <laughs> tonight about world war one aviation from you mike then i probably have by watching documentaries films obviously i grew up like watching like the likes of the blue max and yeah biggles obviously was a terrible film in the 80s wasn't it i mean let's be honest you look back on it now and it's a proper cringeworthy but yeah. as a kid it was just amazing what was the one with um rodney in out of del boy oh i don't know he was in a world war one aviation film it was a bit crap but he was he was in it in the in his the last the last few have been crap you know red baron and the uh, fly boys have been a bit hollywood glammy but even then red baron was good i thought uh, yeah yeah it's a, it's a bit inaccurate and it's a bit oh, yeah. I, I i'd like to bring in now masters of the air because the same issues i have with the red baron are as i think what people are having with masters of the air and i have to be honest I haven't got 
Apple TV. So I've, I've only watched brief snippets on YouTube or, or TikTok. But it does seem to me the Americans, how they didn't win the war, because they seem to shoot down like 500 Mission Smiths every mission, which is amazing because the Mission Smiths seem to fly in at like five times the speed of, of the B-17s. Um, and I think, is it, is it, is it, a bit Hollywood glory, or is it is it quite accurate? Well, well, what I'll say is hold fire until you've watched it. That's all I'll say in the matter. Yes, it's got its issues, but it's actually amazing. And you now we'll, we'll get to that. We'll touch upon that at the end. I think what we we'll do, we're going to knock World War One on the head for now, um, and move on to our top five. So before we get to our top fives, we'll, we'll start with Dan in a minute. Uh, a couple of people have put their top fives on. Anybody who's watching, you want to put their top five once, so it could be current models which are out there, or or ones you'd like to see made. So it's a bit of an open question. So not another train has put. You'd like to see a Western Front Bristol F2 fighter, F2 um, Bristol fighter. I'm absolutely all for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would suggest Andrew McKeever, who, bearing in mind the Bristol fight was supposed to be a two seater reconnaissance bomber. Andrew McKeever shot down 30 German planes, him and his observer. So he was a 30-kill ace flying a Bristol fire, which is amazing. You're thinking how he had to throw that around the sky. Yeah. So I would absolutely love them to do McKeever's Bristol fire. He's also said he'd like a Halifax Mark II Series 1A. I'm not entirely sure of the specifics around that, but any Halifaxes for me are great. I don't know if that is a target tow. Uh, sorry, a glider tow. Glide the tug, I should say. It might well be. Um, he's also asked for a, a bow uh, fighter, night fighter intruder. So I would imagine uh, Cat's Eye Curry, uh, uh, Cunningham, or um, Gibson will probably be a banker for Colgy. I know, I know, um, sure already done them to be fair. Yeah, night fighters, haven't they? Hobby Master. I know Cat's Eye Cunningham and um, Gibson were done, but there was, I'm sure there's a third one as well. He'd also like to see a Junkers 88 Grey Night Fighter. Again, I'm all for that as well. I mean, the new black one looks nice. I know the gondola's wrong on the front, but it does look pretty stunning. And it goes under the War Under Sun theme as well, which is good. Uh, of course, Big Dave Hunt, who uh, he was on earlier. I don't know if he's still on. I uh, hope you're well, Dave. He'd like to see Black Jack in 148 and 172. I'm pretty certain Corgi are doing that in 148 pretty soon. Um, and he'd like to see a Luftwaffe, a uh, Tiger, Typhoon, or Tonka as well, um, which I completely agree. Some of the Luftwaffe schemes in them on them aircraft are absolutely jizzy, I think would be the official word to use. Um, sorry, not another train has just commented on there. So oh, he's still on Merlin engine, round nose, square fins. Oh, there you go. So a Merlin engine, um, Halifax. Yeah, that, and, to be fair, look. Halifax is a, a pretty goddamn sexy. Um, James, uh, obviously, uh, he hasn't put Condor, which I'm slightly disappointed mm -hmm. about. He'd like to see a, Wellington, uh, um, a Polish Wellington, a Polish Mozzie, uh, and the current G. Harry, which I believe is two different schemes either side, James, if, that's, if, if I'm correct. Um, £108. Oh, oh. Who is it? Congratulations. <laughs> what you've been buying. <laughs> <laughs> is that is, is how much you have to pay the captors yes. to let you go? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the ransom. Yeah, that's the, that, that, that's the ransom. <laughs> so, Dan, we're going to go over to you. I've written down, I'll read yours out and you can talk them through because obviously I've only got the numbers and I don't know the specifics around it. So, the the, the five you sent me, you, there was two F4 Phantoms and they were HA19051 and HA1963. Yep. There was an F which is HA51215. These numbers might mean something to someone. So, uh, and two F16s, which are HA3845 and HA3854. Talk me through. So I'll start with the latter first, what you went through. So the two F16s, they are older releases from Hobbymaster. They are purely just because I'm doing Nellis at the minute. For some unknown reason, the Nellis collection seems to just keep on slow down a little bit because I think these two are the only two. Oh, well, I'm missing an F15 as well, um, but just absolutely mad for the Nellis aggressors. Um, and they are proving difficult to get hold of at a price where I don't have to sell internal organs to get. Um, but to be fair, even at that, I, I, they're just not coming up, coming up at the minute. Um, I will find Nellis. 
when I was in Vegas, I was meant to get a Uber to Nellis Air Base, mm. uh, and I had stroke and I couldn't do it. And I'm I, one of my biggest regrets. I didn't mm. do it. I'm mm. gut- my really gut- my sister. She's well, she works for the U.S. Air Force, and she her, her and her fellow went out there. Um, they went to Luke, um, and even though she works for the Yanks, she couldn't get anywhere near on to base at Nellis. It was ridiculous. Um, Luke Air Force, not a problem. Um, but yeah, Nellis was just massive. No, no, can't go anywhere near here. Um, you can go a lot doing all the spotting around the edges and stuff. But uh, yeah, she couldn't get anywhere near it. But one day I want to get out of there. There's so much that goes on. You get, I want to go out there for red flag. Um, but uh, kids are preventing that at the moment, I suppose. Kids yes, well. And what they do now, when the Thunderbirds return to base, they actually fly down the strip as well. Yeah, yeah, it looked pretty, pretty cool. Down. I must admit, I, 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 I wouldn't mind getting out of there. So yeah, them two, um, just to almost complete the Nellis collection until Hobbymaster are just releasing these two newer ones in the, I think they're due in May time, May June. They've just released the pre-pros and going back to colours, they released the pre-pros. They come up wrong. Um, the blue, the tan one was pretty much bang on, whereas the bluey one, it was slightly too light a blue. It needed to be anyway. They put the photos out, had the research back, and they've altered it. Job done. Um, so we'll see what the final production photo comes out for on that. Uh, what else was it? I have actually, I've, I've taken notes, Matt. Scary, isn't it? Um, H. A nineteen oh five one, so puking dogs VF one four three F four Phantom, purely because I've got the um, previous release, the F eighteen Cagbird and the Tomcat as well. Um, I wouldn't mind the newer one, just because it's a puking dogs. Um, got a bit of a soft spot for VF one four three. It was the probably the only Tomcat I've seen at Mildenhall. Um I say I've seen. I was probably about eight months old at the time, so I don't. <laughs> Really, but, you might not remember it, but you did. But see it. I've been there alongside a, a puking um, F fourteen. So that one, um, Screaming Eagles uh, HA nineteen sixty three, Screaming Eagles F four Phantom. Just because I love colourful schemes, uh, looks like a cracking, cracking bird. Uh, and the same for the F eighteen E Rhino VFA twenty seven from the Royal Maces. Just because I'm at the minute, I'm going mad for colourful schemes. I, I, don't get me wrong, I love a great like the, the grey schemes. They're almost the um, the workhorses of the US Navy. Not a problem with them at all. But the cag birds, where they've got all these bright colours on, a lot like the World War One stuff that uh, Michael was on about. It's it, it, I don't know. They just stand out better to me on the shelf. I've just picked up the um, Shrikes F18. F, um, the orange and black one, and it just looks absolutely mega, really does. Um, oh, got sat behind me at the minute. Oh, got yeah, a couple of Jolly Rogers birds sat behind me at the minute, and they, Hobby Master keep on knocking them out, and I think I don't think there'll ever be a Hobby Master catalogue where there isn't something Jolly Rogers. No, <laughs> just it's just mental. They just say, so yeah, that's. That's my top five at the minute. You could ask me again in three weeks' time and that'll probably change. Yeah. One thing I'd add around Jolly Rogers when people say fear the... No, it's one of the phrases I just shake my... It's almost as, it's almost as annoying as someone saying, I want a Condor in 172. <laughs> They're beautiful schemes. They're beautiful schemes, don't be wrong. It's just one of them phrases that I just, it just does my head in. I don't know why. But no, cheers, Dan. A really, really detailed insight into it what you'd like to see. Um, in terms of yours, Sam, do you want to go through yours? So I've got here, you've got F, uh, Hobby Master F22 Spirit of Tuskegee, um, which ties into one of mine that I'd like as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. You've got Hobby Master F4, 432nd. Is that the tactical recon wing, TRW? Yes. Um, with the, yeah, with the with the aim for um, Falcons on it, the, the mid killer. Um, very 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 nice one and actually a really really good sort of story behind it um and also i i just think you can't go wrong with a um southeast asian camo 
um, Phantom, no. to be honest. It's, no, it's a classic. Premium. Absolute classic. Yeah. Um, and I think Hobby Master Phantoms, as of late, they've, they've improved the fit of some of the parts as well. Because, um, you know, you used to, you used to be able to still oh, put, the side, right put the sidewinders on there. They'd, they'd fall off instantly. But, um, yeah, really, really nice scheme. Um, if, if you read, there's a... Um, someone reviewed it on on youtube i think i think it's one of the chaps from um mh3 um he's, he's got he's got a youtube channel where he where he reviews um but i think a aviation the 70 second air wing i think it is this is the name of the yeah. channel um little plug for him there but anyway it's yeah this if, if you if you go on 70 second air wing and search up that and the the story behind it um yeah it's it's amazing i think one one pilot from that um one aircraft from that mission actually got shot down and the i think the 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 wizzo survived and the pilot went down but the wizzo managed to like make it back from north vietnam to you know back just to safety um so yeah it's it's great model that one and then we've got in terms of the other, other hobby master one that i haven't I haven't mentioned the spirit of tuskegee i think with um, I mean, there's about to be. We'll talk about Master of the Air later, but there's there's about to be an episode with the, um, I think with Tuskegee Airmen um, sort of featured front and centre. Um, so a bit of bit of renewed interest in that, and also just just because the F twenty two, I've little sorry? plane to fame. I, I painted their aeroplanes. Oh, just to... there we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Do um, the Margo painting as well then, because Margo's one of the aircraft, isn't it? One of them yeah. is Mary. Um, TFSI and the other one is the Rolls Royce now. Yeah. Peter. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've I've held off getting getting a Raptor um, for quite some time, just just purely because other than the the first two, the, the colours have been have been quite off. Um, but I think I think with this one, I think I think we can just I think we can allow it just because of the the, the homage. I think, and um, yeah, that's. And the thing is, thing is, Raptors they they can even even though they're 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 quite off, they always sell. They sell through, and then and then you find them you find them on eBay for like 120, 130 quid, um, not not long after release. So, yeah, very very popular. And if it, I, I thought the reason why I put that in there, if I was going to add any any F twenty two to the collection, it would be it would be that one, especially because it's going to be. I mean, in the next few years, it will be it will be history because because of requirements and the fact that they haven't put the Spares. helmet mounted sight on it and, and then the F-35 um, pretty much fulfilling its role. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be consigned to the history books quite soon, which I think is quite sad because when it, when it first sort of came out, it was, it was the absolute bollocks. But, yeah. um, oh, is it? And that's, that's the irony of such a magnificent aircraft. It's not done anything. It's just been there. Mm. It's, it's not been used yeah, in anger, it's, or really. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I think. The jacket I think it, it did. It, it, it shot down. It shot down that balloon, and I think it did have. A, I think it did have some action in Syria, which was like a big headline moment. Oh, oh look, we've done something. Mm. It's one of um, the deterrent the F twenty two. I certainly wouldn't want to go like one hell with an aeroplane. Dare I say, I'd love to see it come up against the Su fifty seven in. In, and see what its real capability would be like because obviously the the su-57 is a hybrid russian ripoff uh, i think they've only got like four operational or something stupid like that though the russians haven't they yeah. um but um <laughs> it would be an interesting fight to see what what it'd be like in the in the top pilot's hands obviously it'd have to be you know the pilots are the key things i know it's got all the technology but the pilots what make the aircraft but it's it is uh, i mean look let's be honest we'd rather not see it in action wouldn't we and no. we wouldn't be in action we you know i mean we're in a bit of a uh, a bit of a funny place at the moment with it but it is weird isn't it an aircraft that's so advanced so technically capable has not been needed to be used in any shape yeah. or form it's well the, the um the advanced the advanced tactical fighter program was um born in 1981 um you know height of the height of the cold war where where it was it was fully expected that um hordes of um you know tu-95s or, or or what have you were, were going to be you know coming over any minute so that's that's it's it's very much a, a cold war and it was to replace the 
the F-16 and the F-15. And what's, what we've seen happen is, is the, the 16, the 15 continually upgraded. Mm. Um, and, and the F-22 kind of, they, they stopped, they built 195 of them and then they just sort of stopped. I'll tell you what though, we're talking about the F-16. I think we're about to see what its true capability will be like if, when the Ukrainians in the coming months start to use it. That would be real litmus test because again, you know, other than the Israelis and maybe the Pakistanis as well, they've used quite a bit of a bit of F-16 activity. The Yanks didn't really use it as much during the, the Gulf War. It was more F-16s, wasn't it, and the other aircraft. It, it seemed to take a bit of a back seat, mm. really. Be interesting to see how that gets on again. You know, hopefully by then they don't have to use it, and no Fingers Russians. And... Yeah. But it, it's it's still considering how old it is. It's still one hell of a car. Oh, it's it's one, phenomenal. It's absolutely it, every time. It's so it's, I see one fly. It's so agile. They chuck it about. One of my favourite displays, and I don't think we'll see it back at Air Tattoo this year. Is Solo Turk, and he just absolutely. He throws that aeroplane around the sky. It's mental. Well, the Belgians and the Dutch have bit the bullet now, haven't yeah. they? So, uh, no, the Belgians. I think the Dutch have as well. I think the Dutch... Yeah, I'm pretty certain the Dutch, because all the Dutch ones are going to Ukraine, aren't Ukraine. they? Yeah. yeah, they're transferring to the F-35, aren't they? Late, uh, gentlemen, I'm going to have to love you and leave. That's all right. My phone has just clocked down to 3% battery. No worries. No worries. I'm going to no no uh, get, get some kits on the in the morning, but lovely speaking to you all. No Good worries. Chance. Yeah. We will crack on, we'll crack on in your in your absence, don't worry. Yeah. But thanks for joining. Enjoy, really boys. See you later. I'll see you later. Right, the next one we're going to touch on, Sam, with yeah. a proper left field um, request, the HE one seven seven. Oh yes. So is that, your, is, think, is that yeah? Is that is that my condo? You can say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well. I, I just I, I think it's more interesting than a condor personally. Um, it, you know, in terms of um, in terms of looks, um, it, in terms of the the backstory, um, how, how it, it would it was a requirement to to only have two engines, so you know it could be capable of, of dive bombing. Yeah, I, was gonna, um, I think it was it was a ma they had massive issues in the early days with the engines, didn't they? The engines used to randomly catch fire. Yeah. Um, they were they were colloquially referred to as the uh, Reichsfeuerzeug, um, which is the Reichslighter. Um, you know, because they, they they always used to they always used to burn up. Um, but they did that. They made they made over over a thousand of them. You know, they weren't. Um, you know, which is kind of on par to the uh, Beaufort, which before before Corgi announced the Beaufort, I, I didn't really have much. Um, you know, m much knowledge on it. At all, really, um, you know, bit of an a bit of an obscure one. But the, well, the one seven seven played a role on the um, massively on the Eastern Front. Um, you know, mass the mass raids, mass bombing efforts there, and uh, to a lesser extent, um, took part in Operation Steinbock, which was known as the the Baby Blitz, yeah. um, which was in nineteen forty four. Yeah. So sort of towards yeah. the end, where the the Luftwaffe um basically decided to have decided to have like one last one last crack one last air offensive um against britain so and and if you the, the schemes on it as well are absolutely fantastic and to get that mottling on a on a massive because it would be a massive aircraft i mean in terms of the wingspan you, you, you're probably looking something um similar to a to a lank yeah. um it's a lump it's a lump it really is i know there was it was massively underpowered at first um and that, that obviously with the engine issues as well but it's a good looking aircraft as well it's an unusual looking aircraft it's almost like a jet aircraft without the jet engines you can imagine it imagine those prop engines being swapped out for jets mm. and it looking pretty slick like an early yeah. russian almost do you know what i mean yeah. it, not so much german but like an early russian sort of equivalent of a camber almost yeah and twin twin strut um, main landing gear, which which again looks absolutely fantastic. So, I think I think there's a there's a lot of history there. It's not it's obviously not as celebrated as say uh, you know a HE 111 or a, or a JU 88. Um, it's kind of it's kind of forgotten probably because it was so crap. But you know even I mean Corgi Corgi make a defiant 
So, yep. <laughs> do, do, do you know what I mean? That's 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 kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think I I think it would be I think it'd be a bit of a prime candidate. Probably they're but, doing the, again. They're doing the ME four ten, which is I wouldn't say it's obscure. Cause it's certainly not obscure, but it's not mainstream, is it? No. No, not 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 by not by a long chalk. So um, best possible, this could open the you know maybe even an owl um, could be an option as well. There's some more obscure uh, arados. You know, there's so much that Corgi could get into. Um, yeah, but I, I I think it's a decent shot. You know, it really is. You know, as long as there's there's enough there for schemes and it's viable, why the hell not? Because look, there can only so many he one one ones and. Uh, Dornier seventeens and JU eighty eights that yep. be done. It's got a it, it it's got a lovely sort of um, fishbowl um, type nose as well, which is nice. Um, so again, re real opportunity to go hard on the on the detailing on that. So yeah, I think I think that'd be brilliant. Your next and is a massive winner, by the way. I can't believe it ain't been done. Yeah, with the with the victor. It, look. I, I think if you can, if if we if we can get a Vulcan made in the same style, I think you'd need the plastic wing because of the way it dips. Um, mm. Almost, I just hope. I, I mean, look, there's been lots of hints to say that the the viability is being looked into. Um, a Victor, I was looking up the picture of my dad standing in front of a uh, a camera, and I look up there and see a 148 Victor sitting on top of the shell. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't want it in one. 48 because that would just break the house mm. um, but a vixen for me a vixen needs to be done lusty lindy or something from the gulf war or uh, or something from the black buck missions or they're, they're, they're white victor there's so many schemes i i find um whenever i'm at duxford i find the victor more imposing than the vulcan probably probably it, it could be to do with where it's you know where it's located in that part of the hangar where there's not much else about it could be that but i i, I don't know it's it, it's it's something else entirely um and and that would translate quite well into you know in, into 170 second die cast even, even if they had to do it part you know part and part part die cast part plastic um but yeah i i know i know it's one i know it's one corgi have sort of toyed with and floated before and, and they keep they keep banging on how how they've got like a a five-year plan or a ten-year plan it'll i'm i'm pretty certain it'll come it'll come but it won't it won't be probably just yet but it i, I think it will come but when it when it does it will be you know getting on probably you know 250 plus yeah um but yeah yeah and the final one i'll let you introduce this because i know it's one that's coming to my collection in the coming weeks yep is it uh, so the yeah, so obviously the the Marauder. Um, I'm hoping hoping it makes it for for D Day eighty. I mean, it should be it should be sort of fairly soon, sort of spring summerish. I'd imagine. Um, I know I know we've we've sort of we've sort of discussed this one at length um, before on one of these, and you know we, I think we were all in agreement that it's a really it's a really good one to go after, and it hopefully fingers crossed it should be it should be well executed um i think if you, if you if you put um if you put a few of those on the on the d-day museum that'll they'll they'll just they'll just go because it's that because it's it's dynamite it's that aircraft and um that's over duxford as well you take i think if corgi pitched up i remember when um vra come over and mm. the Canadian Warplane Heritage had a truck outside Duxford, uh, at Duxford, sorry, and there were people walking away with three or four of the Lancasters. Yeah, mm. easy money for me. It's, it, again, it's, you talk about printing money, you turn up with something that's tied into that event, bosh, straight out right the door. 100 and, what is it, £120 a go in it to the Marauder? Yes, but I think without probably without any discounts, yeah, yeah. so... I paid 90 for mine with, uh, I got like a voucher through Colgi and it was brilliant. So I've ordered it for 90 quid, which I think is a bargain to be fair. Um, but, you know, lots of, op lots of scope to sell that this year. Like I said, you know, you turn up at the Utah Beach Museum, but it is Utah, isn't it? I think. Um, mm. And you put a hundred of them in there. I think you'll sell them over the D-Day weekend. 
you know that's easy easy money for me but um hopefully the museum will get a significant amount to to sell as well yeah but, um, definitely i'm conscious of time because we're going over nearly an hour and a half after actually finally getting started which is amazing how this has flowed so freely so over to the main man of world war one himself i'll read through no, what for. don't even you read can... don't even read him because I've either not got the memo or I've changed my mind and sack off, oh, sack thanks. that off, and I'll <laughs> and I'll fire through my top five. Go so for it. Top the t first one that I gave you anyway was a carousel. Word of boss. Yeah. Car carousel are the Rolls Royce of one forty eight, but the Werner Voss one is a minimum three hundred quid, four hundred, five hundred pounds for a one forty eight die cast. That's even that's without the box, which is massive anyway. Is a fantastic colour scheme. There's no reason Corgi couldn't do it. It's it's just basically the the green wash with a yellow nose with a face on it. He was a fantastic pilot. He was, yeah, he was he was number two to to Rick Toffin at the time he was shot down. Would be easy to do. Would be fabulous, and it would save me probably three hundred quid. Second, I know people have been coating the camel off, and it is a bit of a tired old thing. I'd love to see a camel night fighter. Some of the night fighter for the home defence squadrons schemes were fantastic. They'd got World War II style roundels. They had a Lewis gun over the top wing because they couldn't fire the um, Vickers because it blinded the pilots. A little bit of, you know, a plastic detail and they had flares under the wings for when they landed. Really brave. And it would it would follow on for that the night fighter family, you know, the godfather of, of night fighters, sort with camel. Again, relatively easy to do. There's some fantastic schemes out there. If you Google them, they're, they're amazing. Absolutely and brilliant. Quite a station as yeah. well. So it was um, obviously they used to. Um, uh, number three, scramble Crystal fighter. To... We've already the, we've already that... touched on McKeever's potential being a Bristol fighter. What I'd also love them to do is B twelve eighty eight. Uh, Bristol fighter was just after the war, nineteen nineteen, while the armistice was on. They were just sitting around waiting for it to either kick off or, or end. The pilots were all bored, so they just painted all their planes in fantastic, lurid, amazing colours. Some of the American ones, stars and stripes all over. Some of the British ones were just like fantastic checkerboard pattern. But the Bristol specifically was called the Brist Fish. It's got a bizarre fish painted scheme, scales all over the wings, scales all over the body, a fish face over the uh, Rolls Royce Falcon engine beautiful absolutely amazing that would just look phenomenal you know i like to think corgi might be listening to me because when the first bris brisfit came out first thing i said we need to have an afc one for the australians because they painted them in in various degrees of white and pc 10 the new one that came out with the white wings absolutely f fantastic so they're like the three existing that i'd love to see number four and I'm tempted to say an LVG German two-seater ground attack aircraft, just in interest of fairness, because we've only got the Bristol fighter as a as a two-seater. But I'm thinking with my business head on, a de Havilland DH4. It was a beautiful aircraft. The colour schemes and different schemes you could have. The Americans had a Liberty engined one in various gaudy colours. Um, the Royal Naval Air Service used one. You could have an RNA, RNAS one, which would tie in with the other RNAS schemes. Um, they had a day, day bomber, a night bomber. 1919, they used it as a communications aircraft to fly all the top brass over to Paris for the peace talks. They were painted in white. They had the first air ambulance was one with a, a, spe a special adapted back canopy with a big red cross on it. That would look fantastic with a bit of extra work. Um, so yeah, that's my sort of semi-fantasy. And then my big fantasy, and I'm gonna give you a 30 second history lesson. If you think bearing in mind the Wright brothers first flew in 1903, and then for years, everybody was in denial that the Wright brothers had flown and said it couldn't be possible. And the first aviation really took place in Europe from about 1907 onwards. So in 1915, the Germans, brought out a Zeppelin Starken. Zeppelin, who'd made obviously the massive um, airships, brought out a huge plane. If you think of the B-29 in World War II, what a monster of a machine that is. And I know people sort of say, we'd love to see a die-cast B-29. 
if you think that the Zeppelin Starkin, which was built eight years after real aviation in Europe, was only a few feet shorter than it in, in wingtip to wingtip. Wow. It had, it was basically like the stealth fighter of its day, although it wasn't a stealth fighter, heated seats, enclosed cockpits, radios, toilet facilities, communications. It was, by and away, the, it's huge. I mean, it would be probably not feasible, um, but the, the colour schemes would have been the lozenge pattern that the Germans used, navy blues, emerald greens, blacks, greys. It would be a monster. It's never going to get built because it's just it's too big i mean you won't be able to pick it up for a start um but yeah that would be my fantasy fantasy i'm surprised you didn't mention a dh9 uh, well basically the dh9 was supposed to be a dh4 replacement but turned out to be more crap than the dh4 mm. so um and again yeah it it would be great if we, we you know you could list 20 30 planes but what i try and do is think Corgi have got to make it work. Once they've got the tooling, you need to knock out a few. You know, with, with World War One, it tends to be between eight and ten, or sometimes even more. You know, we're on the third Bristol fighter. There's bound to be more that will come in along. The last Albatross was a doozy, but the next one is going to be, you know, probably just as good. The last DR D7, uh, you know, the DR1. The, the latest Spad is fantastic. We are due another camel. It's hopefully... So you've got to think different schemes to attract different people. So DH9 was very limited because it came at the end of the war. It wasn't a particularly brilliant plane. You know, the Bristol fighter, for example, was still being flown in 1935. Cambridge and Oxford University squadrons were still flying that in the 30s. So you've got all of that yeah. post-war, pre-World War. Do you, know, do you know what I think would be absolutely fantastic? A uh, Gotha G5. Oh, but yeah, that'd be amazing. But again, it's not much smaller than the Zeppelin. No. Um, and again, lots of lots of lots of history. Uh, Altair made um, uh, a Gotha, yeah. didn't they? In their biplane series. I think it was a special if you bought the entire lot. It's very hard to find though. It's not easy. It's got a lovely lozenge scheme as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was it was branded as a D'Agostini one in in some yeah. of, a lot of the European. I've I've seen one. But it's 172, so it's out of my. Yeah. Although saying that, check this out. This has got to be the biggest potential. It's not fully die cast. It's got canvas wings, but that's like about a 112, 110 scale. That's stunning. That absolute ton. That is beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Nice. So I have deviated. I, I did say well. I, I did say to start with, I just have one or two, and now I've ended up with over a hundred. And then I said one forty-eight only, and and I've got a couple of one thirty-fives. I've got a one twelve. I've got a one ten. So a full size one next, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're not far off it, mate. You're not far off it. Right. So I'll get onto my top five. I'll try and whiz through them as quick as I can. Um, first one is just one I've never managed to get hold of. Uh, and Dan, who's now no, not on the call, managed to have two of these at one point. I think Jason, who's been on the call, has had about 10 of them. And that's Just Jane, the um, Lincolnshire Aviation Heritage uh, 172 Lancaster. I live in hope that the um, the guys at the uh, the museum decide to do commission another 1,000 run um, Just Jane, which wouldn't surprise me if it gets closer to Air, Airworthy, because I think it's easy money for them. Uh, and fingers crossed they do. I know it will devalue uh, the original run, but it's something Hobby Master are doing now, so it would not surprise me. The second one, and this is where I sort of ask in hope to anybody on the Model Hangar Free Forum or anybody I know, is the Gemini P51C and tying in with Ma Master of the Air in a Mason Bell. Um, it's the hardest Gemini P51 to try and get hold of. It's a stunning bit of kit. It's the only one that is no is not in my collection. Uh, so if anybody knows where it is at any given point, please let me know. I've only ever seen it once on eBay in the last five or more years, and it's always been at 150 quid or whatever it is. I don't really want to pay 150 quid, but it's getting to the stage where I might have to, I think, in order just to get it. Uh, the third one, which, uh, again, is not a, not a mainstream aircraft, but it's an aircraft that we see on the UK scene, and that is a 172 P36 or a Hawk 75. 
uh, specifically the two aircraft in the fighter collection at Duxford, the all silver P-36 or the obviously the Battle of France Hawk 75. Lovely bit of kit. But you're talking about carousel, carousel, make it. Yeah, they do. Um, I was going to say, you said, is it a, what, it's a 148 carousel, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so I, I can't be dealing with it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see the P40B mould reutilised into the all silver shiny finish version that the Fighter Collection have as well. Uh, mm. I think that a surefire seller. I bought a code three one ready for Gary, but we can't find the um, the decals for it just yet. And the fifth one, I think you'll see it mentioned before. Uh, I think not another train mentioned it. Uh, is B seventeen Sally B. Um, for me, it's a no brainer. Um, I don't get why the Sally B uh, group wouldn't commission it and sell it upon their stalls and add an extra tenner to it or whatever to make extra money for them. And I'm sure Colgi would do a partnership with it. And I know Colgi have reached out to the Sally B team, but I don't think it went particularly well. Um, I, for me, it's, it's a no-brainer. There's a, um, there, is, there is actually, there's a bit of a story um, behind that one. Um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar, Mark. So the Colgi made a a one uh, one forty fourth um sally b um but it was they they didn't they didn't get like um permission um from sally b to actually do it and subsequently the lady that owns it whenever corgi have approached them to to make it she's gone nah no and that's and that, that's for me that's short-sighted um because that Colgi was a different rendition of the Colgi we've got now. Um, and I, I find that, you know, if something raises awareness for a cause, which this could do, you could have potentially another £10 on it, which then makes you become a member of the Sally B Club and contribute to the Sally B Club. And then the Sally B Club could then sell it at their stall and sell their membership alongside it as part of that. I don't get why you wouldn't do that. I mean, for me, obviously working in business, I, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong and maybe maybe there's a bit too much bitterness there, but I don't yeah. see... I mean, on, on, in, the same, in the same vein, maybe maybe Corgi could maybe look at doing um, Miss Pickup yep. and, and doing, doing the same thing, you know, and, um, and, and donating to the Catalina Society. Yeah. But, yeah it's it's it, it, it i suppose it's a bit of a it's a bit of a sad one because they would they would like that sally sally b is so is so iconic and, it, and it's for, for anyone for anyone in, in this country it's the b17 yeah so yeah it's it's absolute no-brainer but you know you're aware there's a, a french b17 that's been grounded now for about 10 years at la fertile um and they're now putting work into getting it airborne again. It'll probably take a year or two to get airborne, but it's been doing engine runs. Um, and I think the guy who owns um, the Spitfire and Mustang that was rebuilt at Cywell, this 14 and the, the new all silver Mustang, I think he's helping put the finance into it. You know, you do it with Sally B, you can then open up exactly the same thing with the Pink Lady team. And it adds to the interest of the aircraft. It buys enthusiasm towards that aircraft. It supports its future of the operation of it. And, you know, anything that raises awareness and gets people involved in keeping a significant piece of history in the air, I think it's a brilliant thing. I don't understand why. Look, there might be other things that have gone on behind the scenes there, but uh, for me, it feels like a no-brainer. The other bits I did note down, I know I'm exploiting my top five here, but I, I'm running the call, so I can do what I like. You know what I mean? So um, the other thing I put was B29. Definitely want to see that in die cast in 172 scale. Um, tying into Master of the Air, which we'll get to in a minute, Roses, Riveters. I'd love to see a 100th Bond Group B17 and something that ties into the, the overall film. And, that. and the other one I noted down, I'd love to see, you know, I love little themes. So we talked about the war in the East. We talked about war under the sun, D-Day. I'd love to see the Red Bull fleet tooled in 172. I know we've got the Herpa. P38 at the moment, but it's like gold dust to try and find. I'd love to. They've got the P38 mold, they've got the B25 mold, they've got the Corsair mold, and they've got the new Mustang mold. Four 
aircraft done in a form again sold at air shows we see them over here red bull are pretty much camping over here this summer um British opportunity to to have a all shiny silver birds in the collection so yeah that's my top five um we're going to go on very briefly to master of the air and i don't know have you been watching it sam i have yes i'm eagerly anticipating i mean it's the highlight highlight of my friday morning um when i'm quite unquote working from home <laughs> you know as long as uh, I, you know it's uh yeah, no, it's, it's 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 been it's been brilliant. What what I like about Masters of the Air, they it's it's not ju just purely um, combat. It also shows the the external aspects of it as well, the human side. The fatigue, and and it's easy. It's it's really watching that. It's really easy to see, particularly the um, episode before the last one, um, why they became known as the Bloody Hundredth. Um, because you know the, the the losses were just absolutely disgusting on 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 those poor boys. Um, I know we've we've spoken about accuracy before. I don't think it's too much of an issue because if you think about it's something like I don't know Top Gun Two, n n none of that none none of that really happens. But if they if they were to portray it like it really was and do it accurate to a T, no one would watch no. it. Because it wouldn't make because it wouldn't make for good television. Yeah, exactly my point. And I think one of the uh, I won't name him, but one of the key historians around aviation basically slated Masters of the Air. Um, and the reason being, if it was written by a historian, we wouldn't be watching it. It would be falling flat. Um, no, I think and it is. It is at the end of the day. It's not a documentary. It's a drama series. And that's exactly yeah. yeah it's exactly the point. Um, I mean, there's definitely, you know, in the next couple of episodes, they've definitely deviated from the book in terms of including the Tuskegee Air. And I hope, and I stress the word hope, that it isn't done for the wrong reasons. Because obviously they're a significant squadron, they're significant uh, uh, pilots based in Italy. And obviously they did some missions in southern France, I think from Corsica maybe even towards the later end of the world. I just hope that they've not been shoehorned in for a, 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 an overtly political reason. Because I think there's plenty of, of fighter groups and, and, and fighter squadrons who could have been included, whether it be the Duxford based guys, whether it be Bud Anderson's lot, whether it be, you know, the Martlesham based um squadrons. There's there's so many great stories to be told around fighter pilots and the sacrifices they made as well. Because they're sometimes shown as the the cavalry, aren't they? As the, the uh, look at us in our P fifty one coming to the rescue. When in fact, you know, they took significant punishment as well um whether it be ground missions where we'll be flying into to poles and taking chunks of the wing off them and flying home with holes in their um propeller and god knows what else um but sort of touching upon what michael said you know he said you looked on youtube i don't think the free build-up to the series really showed it in its right light because i was really excited by it and then i see the trailers and i was like ah looks like they've dropped the baton yeah and then when you watch it it paints it it's the best way to describe it for anybody who hasn't watched master of the air yet if you watch episode one it's got all the great elements of memphis bell crammed into one hour that's the way it is it's like if you there's a lot of things that tie into to memphis bell in terms of you know gear not down and the, you know you know, bits of aircraft shot off and the mass formations and, you know, all these different bits. That, that, that And you, you'll think, oh, they've nicked it from Memphis Bell. They haven't. Memphis Bell had nicked it from elements of the book of Masters of the Air and shooed horned it into a film about an aircraft that didn't sustain the damage that Memphis Bell pretended it did because actually it was a pretty nondescript 25th mission, I think, by, by all accounts. But if... I would say this to anybody who's watching it, and I'm not working for HBO, I've not been paid by them. I would say it's it's one of the greatest bits of TV in the 21st century. I would rate mm. it that. Like Sam said, you know, Friday morning, I'll be sitting on the train at well, probably about half five, six o'clock, and I'll get on at Gidea Park, and I'll hope that the train's delayed so I can finish the, the hour's worth of, 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 um, of TV. 
If not, I'll then stick it on in my office, go, oh, I've got to go and check my emails, and I'll play it as I'm checking my emails. Yeah, concerned. I mean, if you like, like if you like Pacific, if you like Band of Brothers, it's it's up there, isn't it, really? Kill the boxes. Brilliant acting. Um, I've learned a lot through it as well, around, obviously, the Schwein for uh, Reagan's Berg mission. You know, I didn't even realise they flew onto Africa. Um, and, you know, there's... That, that one of the most powerful episodes is an episode where you sit, you don't see what happens, and that leaves you thinking, "Oh my god!" You know, mm. in there during the film, you can't even get attached to the characters because you don't know what's going to happen to them. And there's so many different elements around you know, evading capture, and there's there's bits I've learned which I thought I knew a lot about the Eighth Air Force and missions and stuff like that. I've learned so much from it and I really want to go to Fort Abbots at some point during the summer. You know, I know there's not masses there, it's a small museum, but I'd love to go there just to just to feel it. You know, it's mm. a brilliant job. Um I and I'm just gutted it's only nine episodes. Um it's very, very difficult to include you in this, Michael, if you no, watch tell you what I'll tell you what, I'd like to say something now and I and I don't want it to come across as 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 overly worthy. Uh, but I, I think it will tie in with what we were saying about Sally B, what we're, to, we're talking about as as the hobby in general is it's we got. And, and also, even if the Tuskegee Airmen have been shoehorned in for political reasons, even if it's not accurate, it will raise the profile of of the 8th Air Force of World War Two aviation, even World War One aviation. The issue that I have as you know and despite my youthful good looks i'm 50 58 this year i'm nearly 60. after me who's coming with regards to die cast and you know we, we sort of often talk about it in in not bad terms die cast is almost like dying out after us who were where are the collectors you know yeah. af, after us who are the people that are going to show an interest in this and 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 understand it and be knowledgeable about it you know, I, I, I've said before, I've got three teenage boys. They've got no interest in it. Ted, I assume, is doing his GCSE. It's infuriating for me, GCSE on World War One history. You know, yeah. by right. I fully, I fully appreciate being, being, um, being the, the ripe young age of 25, I'm probably in something of a minority. Yeah. Um, and it, and, you know, and when it, when it, and it when, all ties in. So even if it is a bit Hollywood TV and, and political, it will get people people will watch it people will then go and learn the sad thing about the sally b is get your head out of your ass it could only benefit you as an organization it you know mm. if you're selling bucket loads of the plane people will want to come and see the real one even if even if they don't and you're getting no financial benefit from it in this day and age you can't turn down free money you know, no, this is like it. it's short-sightedness of, of people at the moment it, is just so frustrating it goes and this is, uh, I don't know, like, it's very difficult to say this. I don't want to be sounding like I'm, I'm slating Ellie selling boat because I'm not, because she's done a brilliant job to keep a four-engine bomber flying for 40 odd years after the death of a partner uh, who brought it over. Uh, Ted White, I think his name is, wasn't it? Uh, that's why the checkered. in your back and go do you know what i could introduce a whole new generation to this aircraft and the sacrifices the pilots of these similar aircraft made in order for you start to become their air shows today and that's what it comes down to isn't it you know if it weren't for the sacrifice of these young men where would we be and i just i just wish you know like, i know i'm talking about i'm talking about a bit of a metal plane sitting in my collection probably in a box for the time being because i've got nowhere to display it and there is bigger things to worry about in terms of keeping it flying of course but I just wish that, for me, again, it raises awareness and it keeps it, it it's another avenue to keep people interested in it. And uh, so I'm talking about air shows, I mean, look at how many are falling by the wayside. I mean, it doesn't help that the Red Arrows are, are sodding off to North America this summer in the middle of air show season, when the Red Arrows are the single biggest pull for a kid to go to an air show, without doubt, without 100%. Mm. 100%. Kids go to air show and go, oh, what are they? Oh, that's really exciting. That's really colourful. It's really, because that's what it's about, isn't it? It's about the colour and the and the daring and all that. And that them not being on the air show scene this summer when you're losing air shows, no, by the dozen, dare I say, 
in in but that's in... that's that's how it that's how it started for me as a kid you know going to going to chroma and seeing the seeing the red arrows so you know it's um it's crazy but, it's, yeah it's crazy we need to, and, and i guess i know it's only a small band of people which are, are watching this tonight and maybe only touching a very small minority of, of but it's people like us who you know and i, I say us and i'm not bloody revolutionary by any means jesus but it's important that we keep it going and we keep it going. I want to, I want to sure that Rafe really understands why I love aircraft, you know, why I want it to be. Mm. And I hope he likes it. I can't force him to like it. He's obsessed with West Ham instead. But, you know, it's like you said, Michael, where are the next lot coming from? If, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, even the education system appears to, we're almost not allowed to talk about war anymore because it might offend people. Because they identify as a carrot. Do you know what I mean? It's like, well, what is what? You know, uh, I don't, I don't really know what the answer is. All we can keep doing is keep talking about it, keep encouraging people, and keep enjoying when we go to air shows. But look, you look at Duxford. Duxford will always sell out. So it shows that Ria always sell out. There is a massive amount of people who still love it. Just I think there needs to be more and more enthusiasm about it. Yeah. I guess. And it's and it's and it also well. Here's here's a story. I don't know what you two were doing at uh, half past eleven on Sunday morning last week. I um, was at, this I was at Avro's Heritage Museum uh, in Manchester, knee deep in a skip. Is that out, Woodford? Yeah, Woodford. Pulling out bits of paper and magazines and documents that they don't have the capacity to keep that they threw in the skip because they thought I wouldn't be interested in it. Uh, I went over there. I'd got some. Um, they had a fire in the 1940s at Chatterton and they lost a lot of their archive and a lot of documents. I come across huge amounts of stuff uh, every week. I've got some original 1912s photos and postcards of the Avro biplanes um, and the original 504. I'd got a brochure from uh, the King's visit to the Avro Lincoln uh, assembly line in 1946. I give that to them for free. They give me all their unwanted things that they can't store because they haven't got the storage facility. Um, so I was in the skip. Things that I pulled out, a 1969 uh, Boeing 747 Pan Am operations manual. Nobody wanted it. That's gone to a museum in America. Um, 1960s air computers, operating manuals and brochures. They just assumed nobody would want it. Some of them are going to Bletchley Park. Some of them are going to another place in, in, in London. And it's, and it's a sad indictment that, and this is not a reflection of Avro or any of the other museums, they haven't got the funding or the facility or even the staff to, to run things properly. You know, I, I, go to, I go to our local library, I go to libraries and say, you know, I've currently got something in my house, about 3,000 aviation books that I sell on eBay and give away. I went to our local uh, library and they said, no, we can't take any because we haven't got anybody that can book them in. You know, uh, 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 it's, and it's it's so frustrating. It's almost like they're, they're not deliberately whitewashing history, but because it's so long ago now, you know, there's not many survivors from World War II still living. Once that last one's gone, it'll get consigned to history. You know, World War One's long gone. Um, <coughs> you know, think about Harry Patch and, and how long ago that was. It, it, we need to, to keep it going because... The lessons that we are learning now are directly from from historical facts, you know, that all mm -hmm. conflict areas in the world can can be traced back to World War One, post World War One, immediate prior to World War One. You know, it's just it, it's it's just sad, really. It is, it is but look, let's not moan like a bunch no. of old gits because no. Sam's on you. No, I'm, no. I'm off to um, I'm off to go and join Angus Three or wherever it is. Right, final thing we're going to do. Obviously, we touched upon Master of the Air. Let's go back to diecast. What is your model of the month? So we, we, we brought this on. I think it will be a feature for every uh, Wings Monthly. Sam, have you had anything join the collection in the last month? Or have you seen anything that's been released that has really caught your eye? What is it? Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brutally honest. I mean, my, my, my days when I would be buying... A model a month for uh, a sort of long gone with with other other things other financial considerations that have sort of since um taken hold i really 
I mean, I've I've got one, but I really like the um, the Hobby Master of Fowls. Um, I would I would probably be in for another. Um, they they released one with the um, with the nuclear the French nuclear cruise missile attached to the bottom of it. Um, I forget I forget the I think that's yet to come out, but when it when it does, that'll be an absolute absolute cracker. And I mean, I, I've got the uh, the Navy one. Uh, the air air and the valve release and that's that's absolutely brilliant i think christian might have that one as well um but yeah that that for that for me is and but especially when they bring out the nuclear one that that's going to be an absolute absolutely stunning bit of kit um but yeah that's that that would that would probably be what i'm what i'm gunning for other, other than my top five wants which we've already mentioned um that that would be the I suppose the the wild card, as it were, um, but I mean release. I mean, thing is, thing is now um, the hobby master posters. They're, they're they're getting, dare I say it, like a bit a bit samey now. Um, I know I know we've got the we do have the mirages on the way as well. That that'll be that'll be really nice. I think the first first one up is a Israeli uh, pilot. So, yeah, and and then of course Corgi, you've got that. You've got that three-month release structure, which I know. I know we went we went back on this before, but I think that's part of the reason why things are so hard to to get right. Because when they're announced, you can almost guarantee that they're so far along in production, then no no changes really can be made. Um, so yeah, it's it it my my collecting has slowed down but i've still got my you know still got my eye on certain things but i think the like i say they're a foul with the i'm going to try and find out which one it is but with the with the nuclear missile on it i think that'll be awesome lovely mike over to you, right. you. what is your... I'm, go, I'm gonna i'm gonna surprise you now being a world war one obsessive i'll tell you the thing that's exciting me the most is corgi's b26 it's b26 marauder yep little bit of when i was a kid i remember having an airfix model and I, the back wing the the back tail plane i couldn't get right uh, and in the end i think i just smashed it in frustration so i've got a, a little bit of that but the exciting thing for me is it's a new two engine bomber it's showing that Cor corg is not afraid to almost like take a punt because in my limited knowledge there's not going to be that many color schemes that they're going to be able to knock out for a b26 you know well, it uh, I'm sure there's a few, but you know, compared to what they could have, they could have played safe. They could have done something, you know, mainstream. And I think it's, I think that that shows that their intent. It shows their willingness to to you know do something a little bit different, and that gives me hope for the future for World War One. So that's actually quite impressive that you've gone down the non World War One yeah, yeah. scheme. But I'm going to show you mine, and this isn't brand new but it's really important to me to have in my collection. So I'm a massive Spitfire fan. I'm sure those who've seen the, the videos and the pictures of my collection. This turned up, and this is the Johnny Johnson new mould uh, Spitfire Mark IX with the E-wing, so the outer cannons, as you can see, um, and of course the beer barrels. It's unreal, and I don't know if you can see, it's got the, the hydral, the hedral, whatever you want to call it, there is actual dehedral there. Look, you see the actual bend in the wing. It is an amazing bit of kit. It's something I'm going to be doing a video for soon. I was battling to get that out there. As I was trying to casually look like I weren't struggling, but the Spitfire was stuck in by its wings, so I couldn't move it. It's a brilliant bit of kit. The paint finish is amazing. Um, it's just everything I wanted. So for, for those who, who collect model aircraft, the, before the Corgi Spitfire 9 was retold, it was as flat as a pancake. It was pretty bland. Some interesting schemes. Um, it was an okay model, but it just never was quite right compared to the Gemini Spitfire. Can I just ask, what, what's the price point on that? Uh, this I paid £45 for. That? So that's, that's that's good. Pretty, pretty good. I paid £45, but that's from Super Andy Beck. Uh, from Lofty's Models, another little shout out for him. I'm sure, literally, the Welcome to Wings Monthly is sponsored by Lofty's Models. Um, he literally 
a, a brilliant guy, you know, a top guy who's, of course, if you haven't checked out the previous Wings Monthly, Andy's on there talking about his business and why he got into diecast. Um, I've got now all three of the new mould Spitfire. So I've got this, the Colin Gray, and of course the TR9 Gray Nurse as well, which was funny enough, flying over where I live today, was doing some um, circuits at South End Airport, um, about 10, 15 miles down the road. So it's come up from Biggin Hill. Um, so I will do a video on all three Spitfires at some point as well. Um, but that's my model of the month, purely because I've been waiting for that for a while i've not been in a position to buy it and andy very kindly offered to sell his example to me i do have night fright coming as well so i'm sure that probably be shoehorned into next month's model of the month and possibly the bow fighter as well so i am really back into it with nowhere to display them um but it's it's like anything you know like um for those who are not to share too much with you, the last two years have been a pretty interesting journey where I've literally stopped collect it, collecting aircraft overnight. And yes, I've got more than enough already. Um, but to be doing something that gives me a bit of joy and a bit of interest and it helps take away some of the burden of work and it keeps you focused on other stuff. That's why I do this. I do this because I'm passionate about the hobby and I want it to be something I do for the rest of my days, you know, because it, keep, it keeps me... It makes me happy, doesn't it? It makes me happy displaying them, talking about them, learning about them as well, because I love understanding the history behind these aircraft and the people. It's not just about the, the model, it's about that that story as well. And I think that all sort of ties into it. But look, I think that's probably about it. I don't see anybody asking any questions. I think they've all probably either died or gone to bed now. Hopefully nobody has well, actually died. But um, to himself, yeah, yeah. Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I bring Sam on. Obviously, us us old farts, face for radio. He's the face of the. He's the the next generation of diecast collector. Um, like if he turned up at Duxford, everyone there would be like, "Who is this guy? Uh, you know, uh, uh, what's he doing now?" Not. I'm, I'm not coming on to you, Sam. By the way, this is not. This is not me saying like I fancy you. So don't get too excited. I'm just saying you are the <laughs> generation. Um, uh, but when people dress as Field Marshal Rommel at Duxford, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Right. Right? Um, not another train that's just mentioned that is code free. Uh, thanks for the story mentioning. So if you know, I'll, I'll give people shout out. So please give this guy uh, a follow. Not another train. He's just done amazing code free on a B24 Liberator. And it looks absolutely delicious. So uh, please give him a, a follow. Um, obviously, he collects trains as well. So don't hold that against him. Um, no. but, no, not another train. <laughs> yeah, no, not another one. Um, but look, look, that's it from me tonight, guys. Look, Mike, thank you so much for Brilliant. one being a top man, being a you know, uh, a, a, you know, you know. Again, I'm going to give. You know, I think you know, you give people shout outs. So when I've been going through a real crappy period, um, Mike was one of these people who reached out, um, and it, it's really nice to have a. What's the word? A, you know, a a group of people who love the same thing, uh, are really passionate about the same thing. But it's lovely to have that human side as well. And you know, mm -hmm. I've, you know credits due. You no, know, thanks, mate. You know, little things. I know. Like, I mean, in the early days of DWC uh, during COVID, Mike sent me a message over on the DWC page, just saying, look, you no, know, thank you. Know, I'm having. A, you know, he was having a bit of a tough time with the job he was doing and stuff like that and he, he sent this really lengthy message and we talk about you know the model hanger free guys who put effort into stuff and it took effort to write it wasn't just oh thanks for doing the videos it was a very detailed message about look look cheers you know really he's, he's giving me something to focus on something to interest on and it really you know i said this pre-video to him that you know it really hit home that actually you might, you might not touch everybody on the group in terms of the way you know you affect people but it's lovely to know that when you do something like this that people take note and and people enjoy it as well because that's why we do it we don't do it just for just for the sake of it we don't make money out of it it's lovely to have that that i'm sorry it's cost you probably thousands of pounds in die cast mike um but it's lovely that you you reached out and did that because it meant a lot to me as well because it means that what we do has an effect so uh, and thank you so much for actually educating me tonight around World War One. Your yeah. knowledge is fantastic. No, I've learned. I've, I've, you know, I thought I thought I knew a bit about World War One. I've learned loads as well. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah, and I was 
I say that, you know, like, you know, don't be afraid to contact Mike over on the, on the Facebook page if, you, if you're if you going to delve into World War One, And also, if you need a book on World yeah, War One, Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got it's, loads. It's, it's, uh, yeah, she's gone to bed, but what she what he's really not telling us is the bed is made of books, uh, and she's wrapping herself in probably paper rather than covers because that's, you know, that she, the house is just entirely made of books. Do you know what? He's, poor, he's not wrong. Every, room, every room's got books in it. <laughs> so look my no, cheers mate no, look, thank really, you really, really... and and i just like to reciprocate and say you know yeah i i mean i had a i was working for the nhs during the dog days of covid and i was a, a patient care advisor on the phone and you know I, I, you know the darkest night was I, I was on my own one night working till 10 o'clock at night i had seven deaths to deal with and and it's when you're working on the phone and you've got irate families distraught families relatives not understanding that they can't even have a funeral and stuff like that. It, it, it wears you down night after night after night. And I'd go, you know, I was working from home, so that there's not even that when you go home and you get to your house, literally down the flight of stairs. And it was just so good to just, like, bang a DVD on it or, or watch a, one of Mark's nerdy videos about a bloody Bristol bow fighter or, or uh, you know, a Fock Wolf or, or whatever, just anything. It was, it was just absolutely brilliant. But genuinely... I've made so many friends through this group, like you and Sam, James. I know he's a bit of a northern dow faced miserable <laughs> git, but but I've been able to help him as well. With uh, we'll, we'll, we'll allow him. We'll allow him, Mike. He's a gooner. Some some of the some of the the Polish World War Two stuff I've come across and and sent it over to him, and he's so appreciative. You know, there's people like Simon Oliver and Paul Abbott who have got me in contact with with models that I'd never have, have dreamt of owning. You know, and and, it, and it's it's more than just a, a diecast group. It's a friends group. It's it's like Andy's Man Club, but we just talk about diecast. And hopefully we could all get together at Cywell during the summer. Uh, again, a plug and air show, which is dying. But this is some air show at Cywell uh, in the summer. It's arguably the new Flying Legends, whilst Flying Legends is away this year. Um, and it's something I'm really looking forward to. So are you going to that, Sam? Um, what, when is it? It's the 24th and 20th. 25th of June, I believe. I'm doing the Saturday. Okay. Um, but okay. I, might, I might have to, uh, something I might have to have a look at. Definitely. I know Andy Beck is yeah, yeah. doing it. I'm trying to get Dan to do it because Dan literally lives next to Cywell, but he's being a bit of a tart around it. Um, but you know, I know Gary, who obviously helps run the page, is going as well. But it'd just be great, you know, and put this out this now to, to everyone on the DWC community. Um, you know, it'd be lovely to have a little meet up. Um, so, you know, it's. And, and you know, probably all go and hit the stalls together. Although, if you see a model before me, I'll be upset, especially if it's that bloody P P fifty one C. But like I said, to anybody, if you find that, hit me up. I really, really want it. So, <laughs> uh, but look, cheers, guys. Look, thank you so much for investing your time in tonight. Apologies for the the false starts or free um but we could but obviously something was technically very very wrong somewhere down the line but look i've really enjoyed the chat tonight it's gone on yeah. probably twice as long as it would and i've learned an awful lot probably more tonight on world war one that i've learned in terms of over the last 43 years so yeah uh, and thanks on. thanks to those who've, who've um sort of stuck with us uh, yeah, for the yeah, past two hours absolutely. yeah listen banging on about planes absolutely. Absolutely. Obviously, I'll share this on the Instagram page, Facebook page, and then I'll try and upload it to YouTube and make it work properly this time. For some reason, the, the format didn't work properly last time, but it worked. you could listen to it, but half our heads were chopped off. Um, so, look, cheers, guys. Thanks yeah, for thanks a lot. sticking with it. Thank you. What you in tonight. Have a lovely week, uh, and we'll speak to you soon and see you at the next one in uh, April. Forget what yeah. I'm take, take care, both of you, yeah. gents. All right, all the best. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.